What could possibly be more entertaining than an evening or an afternoon at the movies? Something magical happens every time you enter and take your seat as you anticipate seeing your favorite star on the big screen. She is perhaps the best-known American woman in history. She became famous, some say infamous, for creating the dumb blonde. But she was anything but dumb. She could do serious drama. She could be sexy and sultry. She could even make you cry. And she could pull off a laugh. She was Marilyn Monroe, and I'm Les Kranz, and this is Marilyn Monroe in the movies. Marilyn just drew attention, whether she wanted it or not. And when people gathered to watch her, she knew how to play to a crowd. The press followed Marilyn everywhere, and fans couldn't get enough of her. She was the perfect movie star, radiant, alive, and flamboyant. But she could come off innocent, too. Or she could make you laugh. Her blue eyes just beamed. Her voluptuous lips were to die for. The military even imported her to the war zone in as far away as Korea. I'd like to present to you the Look Achievement Award as the most outstanding feminine newcomer of 1952. And it's with honor and pride and pleasure I present this citation to you. Thank you. Marilyn became an icon. There were parades in her honor. Adulation and recognition everywhere she went. To the public, she was the ultimate celebrity. But to Hollywood, and the 20th Century Fox in particular, Marilyn Monroe was star power. Before she was the glamorous Marilyn Monroe, the former Norma Jean Mortensen signed a $125 a week contract with 20th Century Fox. In her first movie, in 1947, the scene she was in was dropped from the film. In another, dangerous years, the best the former pin-up girl could do was a face-in-the-crowd bit part. But a vocal coach, Fred Carger, thought she was worthy of more, and in 1949, after coaching her just a few months, Marilyn starred in her first significant part in a movie at Columbia in a low-budget film about burlesque, Ladies of the Chorus. Fine thing, fighting like a couple of alley cats. What are you trying to do, give burlesque a bad name? Marilyn co-starred with Adele Jurgens, who played her mother, who supported the family by taking off her clothes to music. And her daughter was, well, a stripper too. And she was in love with Rand Brooks, whose mother, Anita Bryant, didn't approve. But Eddie Gar played on. You'll be sure to send this right away, won't you? Wouldn't you rather deliver it in person? Peggy. Hello, Bobby. How about a song? Folks, you all know Peggy Martin to burlesque. Marilyn's character may have been embarrassed, but the real Marilyn Monroe was unabashedly comfortable with being a sex object in her first starring role. Having so far only played ditzy blondes, this 1952 film showcased Marilyn as a dramatic actress and she shined. She had full command of her character, Nell Forbes, an anguished, psychologically disturbed babysitter who became entangled with airline pilot Jed Powers, played by Richard Widmark, who had just broken up with lounge singer Leslie Lynn in 20th Century Fox's Don't Bother to Knock. Anne Bancroft, the love rival of Marilyn's character, 
also established herself as a dramatic actress. And she, like Monroe, would play Filmdom's sexiest parts, including in The Graduate, as Mrs. Robinson. I'm the guy in 821 across the court. Can I ask you a question? Well, I don't know. I suppose so. Are you sure you want me? Yeah, you're the one I want, all right. You doing anything you couldn't be doing better with somebody else? If you want. Let me come on over. stepped into that room, I ran smack into an adventure you don't forget in a long time. Because the screen has never shown this kind of woman before. The kind that reaches out in the loneliness of the night to a stranger passing by. I should have seen the warning of danger in her eyes. But what happened in that suspense-filled night was about to change my entire life. Why didn't you tell me you were working here? I'm not. I'm just doing it for tonight. Yeah, I know. You're an heiress. Tomorrow morning, you ride through your estate. Side saddle. She made you say that. I believe in a drink, a kiss, and a laugh now and then. I still like to laugh. But not at myself. What do you want? Hearts and flowers forever and ever? Love? Don't be afraid to say it. It's not a dirty word. I can't figure you out. You're, you're, you're silk on one side and sandpaper on the other. I'll be any way you want me to be. Why? Why is it so important? Because I belong with you. Pat, it's 8.09. I'm frightened. I think something's happened. <laughs> you all right? Yes. Yeah. Don't Bother to Knock didn't set box office records, but for Marilyn, it was a vehicle that not only cast her with a screen heavy, Widmark, it also established her as someone who could hold her own in a screen drama. She looked radiant, and she knew how to handle herself in front of a camera. Other than Widmark, the cast was not well known, but the leading ladies were getting ready to blossom. Could there possibly be a better comedy duo than Marilyn Monroe and Cary Grant? In this 1952 film from 20th Century Fox, research scientist Dr. Barnaby, played by the lady-killing Englishman, lacked sex appeal. That is, until one of the animals in the scientist's lab escaped his cage and monkeyed with some chemicals that, well, changed the doctor's libido and it changed the relationship between the good doctor and his secretary. Yes, it's monkey business, all right. And believe me, Kerry never had so much fun in his life. Want to know why? Well, just look at what goes into this monkey business. There's a generous helping of ginger. Ginger Rogers, that is. A dash of Charles Coburn for a chaser. Plenty of Marilyn Monroe for spice. It would be Marilyn's first role in a slapstick comedy, and it proved to fit her like a glove. I've done a lot of experimenting with this guy. Come in now, if you're not too busy. <laughs> Miss Laura was just showing me her acetates. It all began when Rudolph, the chimp, discovered the formula for eternal youth that makes people grow younger and younger and younger. Edwina, what I have to tell you is unbelievable. Oh? Oh, well, I'll start at the beginning. Edwina, at 11.52 this morning, I took a dose of the formula. And in a few minutes, I began to behave exactly like a college boy. Yours? Yeah. Takes a while to warm up. Does me too. J. 
Ginger Rogers, who hardly danced at all in this film, played Marilyn's love rival. Playing a plain Jane, Rogers' stoddy screen presence only made Marilyn look that much more appealing. Hi, Dr. Fulton. Hi. What'd you say to her? Mrs. Fulton, he said hi. I heard what he said, you peroxide kissing bug. Edwina, she didn't do anything. I'll pull that blonde oh. hair off by its black root. Edwina, please. Edwina, come stop on, it. Come on, Miss Laura, you keep out of the way. <laughs> Monkey Business was formula screwball comedy. In it, Marilyn Monroe was only fourth in the cast billing, but the comic flair she demonstrated so well would open myriad new avenues in her career and provide lots of laughs for movie audiences to enjoy in the 1950s, and Marilyn would emerge as one of the great film comedians of her era. The following year, in 53, Marilyn starred in a suspense drama that had audiences biting their nails as splendid cinematography flashed across the screen. In Niagara, directed by Henry Hathaway, Marilyn's character, Rose Loomis, was the embodiment of sexuality. Married to George, played by Joseph Cotton, the femme fatale scorches the screen with her torrid love affair with another man. sang of love just as she lived for love, like a Lorelei, flaunting her charms as she lured men on and on to their eternal destruction. And her own husband was no exception. It's getting late. Hand me my slip. I hate to move when we have a fight. Never want to leave your side. <laughs> Get me some orange juice, Georgie. <laughs> it's Marilyn Monroe skyrocketing to new dramatic heights. When a man took her loveliness in his arms, he took his life in his hands. Joseph Cotton, helpless in her siren spell. Jean Peters, caught in the destructive whirlpool of another's deceit. And parading around, showing herself off in that dress, cut down so low in front you could see her kneecaps. She's a pretty girl. Why hide it? Don't worry about that. She'd like to wear that dress where everybody could see her, right in the middle of the Yankee Stadium. Smell like a dime store, I know what that means. Sure, I'm meeting somebody. Just anybody handy, as long as he's a man. But she could never be his, nor any man's, completely. And that thought whipped him into a frenzy that makes the screen thunder with unparalleled suspense. Hello, hello, please? The movie was as powerful as the rushing waters of a storm. At its center stage were two mighty forces of nature, Niagara Falls and Marilyn Monroe. It debuted in one of the most important years of Marilyn's life, 1953, and it would be the first of three consecutive smash hits for her. That year, not only would she begin to date Joe DiMaggio, she'd also be in the centerfold of Hugh Hefner's new magazine, Playboy. And thus, the newly minted screen icon became firmly cemented in America's cultural radar. There was another 1953 film, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which established Marilyn as the sex symbol of her era. Not only did she lose sex appeal, Marilyn came off as sophisticated, but not exactly as a rocket scientist. The image of the dumb blonde became associated with her, especially in her comedic roles. 
Yes, <laughs> it was a great book. Greater is a Broadway stage hit, and even more gorgeous, glittering, and hilarious on the screen. With Marilyn Monroe as Lorelei Lee, the world's most fabulous gold-digging blonde. I just love finding new places to wear diamonds. Another musical in Cinemascope, 1953's How to Marry a Millionaire, was the very first widescreen film. And it had audiences talking, talking about Hollywood's next big thing, the widescreen. Cinemascope was invented to combat Hollywood's arch enemy, television. In a desperate attempt to lure audiences back to movie theaters, it featured not only glorious Technicolor, but superior sound too. And it worked. Marilyn Monroe starred with Betty Grable and Lauren Bacall. New York City was one backdrop, another a plush private plane, not to mention glamorous nightclubs and lots of men for the trio to flirt with in How to Marry a Millionaire. Yes, just watch the fur fly as the most talked about girls in Hollywood go out loaded for big game. Monroe, Grable, and Bacall adding their own wonderful dimensions to the eye-filling dimensions of Cinemascope, letting you in on the grand and glorious adventures of three fascinating females who pool their beauty in the greatest plot against mankind since Helen of Troy, Marie Antoinette, and Venus de Milo. Fabulous Cinemascope screen was practically as big as New York City with all its fabulous attractions. It even had thrills on the ski slopes of Maine. Every scene was glamorous, including these three screen beauties who were always dressed to the gills in the latest fashion attire. And they would go almost anywhere and do almost anything to meet men. Dreamy men like David Wayne, Rory Calhoun, Cameron Mitchell, and William Powell in 1953's smash hit, How to Marry a Millionaire. Not long after Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Marilyn and Joe DiMaggio became an item. In 54, the biggest baseball star and the biggest movie star exchanged vows. The marriage only lasted nine months, but it sure gave the rest of us something to talk about. It even made the newsreels. Tokyo Airport, a throng of 4,000 baseball and movie fans surge out of control, break through police lines. Joe DiMaggio and his bride smile bravely at their greeters, but they don't dare move. So back into the plane they go, while police clear a path to the cargo hatch with the DiMaggio's convertible. The stratagem works. The former Yankee slugger and his picture bride escape into the car and head for the safety of their hotel. But their troubles aren't over. Next day comes a press conference where the public was barred, but the photographers and reporters more than made up for that. Their questions were rough, ranging from the risque to the ridiculous. And Joe, he's the forgotten man, which is something in Japan where baseball is so popular. I mean, never underestimate the power of you-know-who. But enough's enough. His patience is exhausted, and Joe says, go. There's never been a musical like it, and there's never been a story like it, and Hollywood never assembled a cast like it. And there's never been a show like it. Irving Berlin's There's No Business Like Show Business. It was in Cinemascope. It had the greatest singing and dancing and romantic stars ever cast in a musical. 
It starred Ethel Merman, Donald O'Connor, Marilyn Monroe, Dan Daly, Johnny Ray, Mitzi Gaynor, and a cast of hundreds. From the Great White Way to the Pleasure Palaces of Miami, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the show business that no one knows better than the master of them all, Irving Berlin. The great stars, the great performances, the great spectaculars, the great heart of show business. Your dating is so beautiful, Steve. <laughs> Father Donahue. You're drowning me. Don't put any ideas in my head. Don't worry, honey. You'll make it. You've got what it takes. And you know how to use it. Get out. Get out of here. I'll tell you what you are. You, you're nothing because you made yourself into nothing, you conceited little punk. I wouldn't care if I never saw you again. Oh, come on. Now, Pop, I heard there's a big crop of corn this year, but... What? Corn. H-A-M, corn. And Marilyn danced. And she danced. And she danced. And the whole stellar cast danced and sang some of Irving Berlin's greatest hits. And there never was a show like there's no business like show business. In 1955, 20th Century Fox would use a likeness of Marilyn's Body Beautiful four stories high to command public attention to launch the seven-year itch. Careful, I had my appendix out last year. <laughs> it's the funniest comedy since laughter began. Of a wife who spent the summer away, and a husband who stayed home to play and play and play. Because now I'm going to take you in my arms and kiss you very quickly and very hard. Hey, wait a minute! With Marilyn Monroe, soaring to new heights as the screen's most lovable laugh yet. Everything's fine. A married man, air conditioning, champagne and potato chips. It's just a wonderful party. Tom Ewell, who created the original role on Broadway. Evelyn Keyes, Sonny Tufts. Robert Strauss. This is what they call classical music, isn't it? Yes. I could tell because there's no vocal. Shh. Don't talk. Let it sweep over you. Relax. Go limp. Like this? I've been married for seven years. And I'm afraid I'm coming down with what you and Dr. Steichel call the seven-year itch. <laughs> what am I going to do? If something itches, my dear sir, the natural tendency is to scratch. I scratched last night. She was a saloon floozy, a dance hall girl, who knew all about men. He was a naive rodeo cowboy. And they, well, interacted. And not always like ladies and gentlemen. But sometimes they got along just fine. In 1956's romantic comedy, Buster. No one but Marilyn could do justice to Buster. The smash hit that had Broadway howling for more and more. With Arthur O'Connell, Betty Field, and Hope Lang as her traveling companions. And just look at the guy who ropes Marilyn. Introducing Hollywood's newest hunk of man, Don Murray. <coughs> he didn't want her to know that when it came to women, he knew nothing but nothing. She didn't want him to know that when it came to men... She knew plenty, but plenty. Of course, there's only what you might call a physical attraction. Physical. 
I mean, you're so big and strong and, well, so darn healthy looking. Yes, I do keep myself in pretty good shape. Of course, you got it when you're competing in a rodeo like that old class A event. You got this idea that a woman is like some animal you're trying to break. That's right. But there are some gals who don't like to be pushed and grabbed and lassoed and drug into buses in the middle of the night. He could ride like a fury, throw steers like a fiend, do push-ups like a champion. But when it comes to taming this filly, he really has a bronco by the tail. In 1957, this, quote, dumb blonde left 20th Century Fox to start Marilyn Monroe Productions and teamed herself up with arguably the greatest actor of the 20th century, Laurence Olivier, a classically trained actor from the British stage. He and Marilyn, who was still studying method acting, weren't exactly a match made in heaven off screen, but on screen, they made it work. showgirl had a few ideas of her own. What are words? Where deeds can say so much more. <laughs> that is terrible. I'm going to fall in love with you. Because I always, always do. Always? Hmm. Both times. I love you. I love you. Oh, gosh, your grand ducal highness. How I love you. <laughs> The girls might not have been the best looking, and Marilyn Monroe might not have mastered the ukulele, but she sure mastered the art of comedy in this one. Some Like It Hot from 1959 might be Marilyn's greatest role and certainly one of the best movies of the 50s. In fact, the American Film Institute named it the funniest movie of all time. And it was funny. Not since Scarface, so much action. Not since the Marx Brothers, so much comedy. Not since the seven-year itch, so much Marilyn. The best picture this year will also be the funniest. Good night, sugar. Good night, honey. There's one thing sure, boy never met girl like this before. You've never laughed more at sex or a picture about it. You stay here as long as you like. If you like it hot, this smooch fest was blazing perhaps the steamiest kissing scene the two actors had ever been in. What else would you expect when you team up a screen siren like the voluptuous, curvy Marilyn Monroe with a lady killer like Tony Curtis, who played alongside Jack Lemmon, George Raft, Pat O'Brien, and funny man Joey Brown. Hear Marilyn sing the fabulous songs of the Roaring Twenties on the United Artists' soundtrack album. 
The leading lady's role was originally intended for Mitzi Gaynor, but when director Billy Wilder let Marilyn test for the part, that was it. She was the embodiment of a ditzy showgirl, and no actress could get more mileage from a ditz than Marilyn. And her co-stars, dressed in drag, hardly had to open their mouths to get a laugh, but they got enough to make Some Like It Hot a comedy sensation. Hold it! Here comes the girl who put mmm into movies, Marilyn Monroe. In this 1961 film, 20th Century Fox was glad to welcome Marilyn back after she left to do films for United Artists and Warner Brothers. But some said she looked a little overweight, though no one complained. It was another musical, a remake of a Broadway show, On the Avenue from 1937. Marilyn is always radiated. Her trademarks of innocence, vulnerability, and sensitivity jumped off the screen. And she radiated too with co-star Eve Montan. And off screen, they had a torrid love affair. Yes, Marilyn is having a ball. Let's join her. Let's sing and laugh and make love together with the most talented people you ever met. First, there's the greatest gift France has sent us since the Statue of Liberty, Eve Montand. If you mean what you say, money doesn't mean anything to me. I get jobs. Will you forget all that? Oh, my dear Carol. I don't have waited to hear that. I'm so glad. And loads of laughs with Tony Randall. And Frankie Vaughn, the singing idol of England. And Wilfred Hyde White. And guest appearances by three of the greatest stars in show business. It's all about what you can't get enough of. Fun, joy, and love, love, love. With great words and music by Cole Porter, Sammy Kahn, and James Van Heusen. In 1961, The Misfits, in which Marilyn starred with Clark Gable, would be her last completed film, though in 62, she began production on Something's Got to Give, and it did. Marilyn would die a suspected suicide while making that movie a year after this one. Marilyn's husband wrote The Misfits screenplay, but by the time filming started in 1960, Arthur Miller would divorce her. This man is John Houston, two-time Academy Award winner. These giants of the entertainment world have combined their talents to create an outstanding motion picture. Starring Clark Gable in his greatest role. most exciting woman, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn, obviously a little heavier than usual, and maybe a little less appealing. Also co-starred with Montgomery Clift. He, like Marilyn and Gable, wouldn't live very much longer. 
Clift, rugged and handsome here, would die by his mid-40s, and Gable would die just two weeks after completion of The Misfits. these outstanding talents in a shattering story of people caught in a flood of emotional cross currents and the result is the misfits the aging gable had been Marilyn's screen idol since childhood and she adored him his death which came just two weeks after this tender love scene would grow the hollywood myth that the difficult times filming the misfits contributed to the untimely deaths of all three of the film's headliners Some said The Misfits was Marilyn's best dramatic role. She was despondent about her divorce while making the movie. Her downward spiral, complicated by alcohol and the abuse of prescription drugs, took a toll on her health and her emotional stability. Marilyn's days would soon be over. In 1962, Peter Lawford made a prophetic introduction. Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. retire from politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet open way. Three months later, a tragic event made the movie newsreels. One of the most famous stars in Hollywood history is dead at 36. Marilyn Monroe was found dead in bed under circumstances that were in tragic contrast to her glamorous career as a comic talent. On the surface, she seemed to have such a zest for life. Her international appeal took her from command appearances 
to the other side of the world and entertainment for Korean GIs. The star led a far from normal childhood and had 12 sets of foster parents, leading her to say in her last interview that she was never used to being happy, so it wasn't something she ever took for granted. She never let her personal feelings interfere with her job, and she was the idol of the GIs, the animation of foxhole dreams. She found no happiness in marriage. Her second husband was baseball immortal Joe DiMaggio, and that marriage ended as had her first in divorce. Her third husband was playwright Arthur Miller, and they too separated. Miss Monroe played in 23 films since her debut in 1950, films that grossed $200 million. The Golden Girl received 5,000 fan letters a week, and to those fans, she never let any personal problems dim her screen glamour. Despite flashes of temperament and tantrums, she turned in performances that kept her among the greatest box office favorites in motion picture history. Brief and simple rites marked the funeral of Marilyn Monroe. As former husband Joe DiMaggio leads a small group of friends in a last tribute to the glamorous actors. Only 25 persons were invited to the services and no screen stars were in attendance. Miss Monroe's dramatic coach delivered the eulogy, saying he had no words to describe the myth and the legends that grew up about her. The film star's coffin is then moved to a crypt as Mr. DiMaggio and his Marine Corps son walked with other mourners in the cortege. Five hundred curiosity seekers were kept at a distance all during the ceremonies, and Mr. DiMaggio and his son were among the last to leave. The final fade-out to the story of the poor girl who became a movie star is written, Finis. <laughs>